own that thing. I'll Good to go. Um, let see, I should share this again. Okay. Cool. Um, all good? Yep, perfect. Hey, folks. How's it going? Hi. Everyone had a good weekend? Yeah, that is. Dana, how was Codeland Conference? Oh, Codeland Conference was awesome. Um, GitHub was there, they did the after party, uh, there was a lot of group dancing <laughs> in the auditorium, as well as um, in the GitHub party room, a lot of hip hop uh, Indian music, which was That's great. Awesome. Um, downtown, downtown Manhattan is awesome, yep. I just went to extensive music. Yep, yep. <laughs> and um, made some um, great connections, nice. um, a couple of people from um, Microsoft offered to be mentors and also said we're very busy. So if you want to hear from us right away, as we expect, <laughs> we'll awesome. contact you. So it, it was great. And hopefully, we didn't get a chance to go this year. Maybe we'll consider going next year. It's totally worth it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Awesome. Um, yeah, definitely keep your eyes out for conferences too that you think might be uh, a good fit to go to. Um, I know partners are only four weeks, but um, share any of those opportunities that, you know, events happening locally, New York City, whatever. Um, so feel free to share those if you see this come along your way and we'll see if we can get you up to it. Um, but just a few, quick few announcements, guys, and then I'll ultimately hand it over to Josh, who will be our guest speaker today. Um, so, real quick, um, this week you're doing authentication, a bunch of plus time with Max. Um, David is your teaching assistant for this week. And then the next next week and the following will be the advanced React weeks with Joey. And then ultimately that final week will be um, the final push for the capstone stuff. So just a quick rundown. Um, I can't believe it, guys. There's four weeks left. Where the heck did all the time go? Um, it's going to be tough these next couple of weeks. We know. Reach out for help. Um, those one-on-one -on -one sessions, take full advantage. It's going to be hard. But uh, it's going to be amazing when you on that August 22nd when we show up all the hard work we've done over these 24 weeks. Um, just a quick couple of things, guys. Um, just uh, please review that last week of class rundown. I have this all in like the announcement document as well with links. Um, I'll be talking about that again as the date gets closer, but I'm, I'm going to say it every day on Monday just to review that if you have any questions on what the last week looks like. Um, also, when you're able, please RSVP for the Capstone Meetup. I see a lot of you have already, so thank you. There is an option to add, I think, up to five guests. So there's technically no limit on how many people you can bring. Um, but please, if you are bringing guests, just like add the people that are coming. So that way we know how much food and stuff to get. Um, again, one-on-ones, continue to take advantage of those one-on-one -on -one opportunities with all your instructors and teaching assistants. Um, and then next week on Monday, that'll be August 5th, we'll have our, I guess, technically last demo day before like the dry run on the final week. Um, so that by that point, you know, you should be pretty well into React if you are able to get a couple of test cases. That'd be awesome. So a requirement, but by that point, after this week, you should have some basic auth going in your app too. If you are planning on implementing that, um, so that's kind of where you should be at for the next demo day on the fifth. Um, and last thing here, um, as you're writing code, I, I assume that someone has told you this already, and if not, um, a reminder if uh, they haven't. Um, commit and push your code for any project, in particular Capstone, early and often. Um, if you get something working and it's like, okay, awesome, I spent all day doing this, commit it, push it. Because um, then you might make a small change, You're like, oh, I got this, I got this, oh, oh crap, something broke, I gotta undo a million times. Oh, wait, where am I on my project? Commit and push your code often and early. Um, so that way you don't spend hours and hours, like I'm sure every one of us have, trying to figure out where the hell did my damn code break. Um, so commit and push your code often. If it does break, you know to, where to revert to. Um, so um, without further ado, we'll have, we have two awesome guest speakers this week. Josh, I'll bring up in just a minute. And then we also have um, a Thursday, a guest speaker, Seth Mulligan, who will be joining us. But today, we're very fortunate to have Josh from Air Electronics joining us. So 
a little bit about Josh. Um, Josh um, has been an amazing, amazing partner over the past few years. He supported us, I think, since day one of Hack Upstate. Um, and we've helped to, he's helped to amass a pretty amazing hardware lab um, for our event. So we have like three or four now, I think, giant yeah. pallets, or not pallets, but crates of um, hardware that's been really amazing. So Josh is going to tell you a little bit about him, what he does, and hopefully help to demystify the world of hardware and software and how they work together. So very fortunate to have him today. He comes all the way from Buffalo. So very Buffalo, right? Rochester. Rochester. Dang it. Only Rochester. Rochester. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Probably Buffalo tomorrow morning. Yes. So, yeah, so he's all about those. Yeah. But, um, same, like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Without further ado, how many, uh, welcome Josh. Thank you, Josh. Very uh, So I put these out here just because cards are stupid. Nobody likes cards. Digital information is way better. Uh, were you going to send this out to everybody? Oh, yes. Because you, you can. Yes, I will. <laughs> it's all over there. Well, in my email and phone number on it, as Jesse said, I'm Josh. Uh, but these are little, and Will and I were just talking about how we're Bluetooth for stuff, yeah. and, right? But this is a little cord holder that you can wrap your headphone cord around, and it has a logo on it. I, uh, a local company up in Buffalo made them for me. So that's way more fun than like business cards. <laughs> Nobody keeps that. Uh, so yes, I work for Arrow five years out, which conveniently I just celebrated my five year anniversary with them. So we just had layoffs two weeks ago and I was worried that they're like, hey, five years that you are out. Oh, oh no, but I snuck through. So that was good. Um, my title is uh, account development rep. And what that means is I go out and find new stuff, new opportunities from a traditional customer base we work with like lockheed and, and harris and um kodak you know any, any of the big anybody that has electricity going to a thing we work with them um and we do specialize on the hardware side but i kind of want to talk about how software and hardware mix together to make a thing and you know hopefully give you some ideas uh for the future so only a quick 80 85 slides to go through. Uh, so we are probably the largest company you've never heard of. Um, by the time you've had your morning coffee, we love this marketing slide. By the time you've had your morning coffee, you've interacted with Arrow five times, you didn't even know it because your alarm clock has stuff from us in it. Uh, now, now the big thing is like the cooling blankets Right? Have you seen that? That it can either heat or cool, like a comforter that has AC built into it. How awesome is that? Uh, and I want one of these so bad because my wife's always cold and I'm always hot and it, it doesn't work well, right? With with the whole sheet thing. Um, or you get two twin mattresses and you know, come together for <laughs> that special one night a month. <laughs> and by the time you go to bed, 20 times you're going to interact with with Arrow, because uh, automotive is one of our biggest segments, just because now we have so many different electronics in it. Uh, not just the stuff that like Tesla is pioneering and self-driving cars and that type of stuff, but the sensors. Um, uh, if you have adaptive cruise control, you're using the sensors to figure out how far an object is in front of you to give you that warning to slow down. Don't ride them so much, Josh. Uh, so uh, those are some of the different things that we get involved in. Uh, on a larger scale and overall globally the reason i say we're the biggest company you've never heard of is this is a little old but we're about a 30 billion dollar company we have a global impact and we've been around since the 1930s we started on radio row uh down where wall street is now and now our home office is in denver and we are the largest public employer in the state so uh not that you guys notice this stuff but a few years ago the broncos were, had a good season and they were in the playoffs and they all had like little orange beanies on the sideline and they all had an arrow logo on it. You guys didn't notice that, but every employee that's watching is like, wait, we bought them hats? <laughs> but okay, yeah, that's, that's us there. So uh, we also, let's see, what was it? Uh, so the Ravens were in the Super Bowl. I'm, I, I'm not really a sports guy, I promise. Uh, but the Ravens were in the Super Bowl a few years ago. What was that like five, six years ago? And they were playing the Niners, and, and they were losing to the Niners. And at halftime, the halftime show goes. They're about to come back out on the field, and somebody hit the power switch. 
and turn the lights off on the stadium and they're incandescent lights, that means it's at least half an hour once you figure out who screwed that up to get those lights back up and on and delayed the whole thing. The Ravens apparently got their act together and came back and won. So that was kind of like, wow, that's amazing. There was a little company here called Ephesus whose phone was blowing up. They did outdoor lighting for stadiums and they've been trying to get into the NFL. And that this happens, the NFL, the right person knew, Joe, the owner, is just getting lit up with, we need your stuff now because they were the front runners of LED lighting for stadiums, for outdoor usage, for parks and stuff like that. The next year they lit Phoenix, the Phoenix stadium. And since then, Ephesus and now Eaton that bought them has been lighting the Super Bowls and lights at, at least the majority of the stadiums in the U S which is kind of a cool Syracuse success story that a little company that started here from nothing that arrow was also an integral part of and supporting ends up doing this awesome thing. And now they're like a huge known thing. So I think that's kind of cool. And we want to look, and I promise I won't spend a ton of time on all these slides. Uh, but we want to look from design, production, reverse logistics, all the way through end of life. What are you going to do when your projects are done? So I focus a lot on the design and production side of it, um, just because that's where startups are. They don't have a product that's going into end of life status, right? They're trying to get their first one out the door still. So looking at how the design interacts with software and hardware, where are going to be the right components to be able to put in that does go end of life. There's a medical company over here that didn't do a lot of checking on products and they had to do 37 redesigns before they got a product launch because a different part kept going end of life. And, you know, they have FDA certifications and they have to do all this stuff. So it was just pushing everything back and back and back. We can help short change that and be like, no, you have guaranteed life for five more years on this. Now this isn't recommended for design. I'm showing you that. And we can kind of help bypass that step to get you uh, to market faster and going through each of these that's that's one of the things that we help um, when we're looking at the system and module design we also have partners that we can help you in doing the designing side of it so if you guys had like an awesome idea you're like I can do the code for it I know I can do the code I don't know the hardware side of it we have partners that we can help with to do the design uh, to get your product out to market um, a very smart guy once told me that the real differentiator in software is a hardware that it runs on. So uh, you can have a great algorithm, but if you don't have the hardware in one sense or another, it's, it's difficult to stand out from a crowd and, and get traction. It's not like Facebook was the first social media out there, right? I know you guys all keep your friends through the accounts. <laughs> <laughs> So, and this just kind of goes through some of the different segments that we have, being the giant company that we are. We have components, we sell co complete computer systems, server grade, value recovery, looking at asset disposition. And, oh, there's, there's a little drone company that apparently when you call the 800 number for them to get replacement props and, and struts and, and anything else for your drone, you're actually talking to an Arrow employee. How they figured that out, I don't know. I never thought of doing that. Uh, but that's kind of cool that we have enough flexibility in what we do in our workforce and in our warehousing that we can stock your drone replacement parts and have a sales team that you're calling on on the 800 line. So, but one of the things that I am most excited about is what we do with Indiegogo. So Indiegogo, you, you guys are familiar with crowdfunding, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Indiegogo, like five, five, six years ago, there was a project on there called the Laser Safety Razor that was for shaving your face. And it was supposed to be powered by like a double A, triple A battery or something. Uh, the two problems I have with that in the mornings, I'm not, I don't have the steadiest of hands, right? Like I have a straight razor that I haven't even tried to use. I'm, I'm not crocodile ND, uh, which only three people in the room. 
got that reference. Uh, but uh, uh, so I don't, I don't have the steadiest hand and your jugular isn't really that deep. So using a laser to cut your hair, that just didn't seem that safety side of the razor part, right? But then the other side of it is really the way we are in our society, we are not technologically advanced enough to have a battery operated laser that could actually cut hair this was total vaporware. This was never going to happen. It was not going to come out. They had raised a few million dollars uh, before Indiegogo figured out, hey, that's that's not going to be a real thing. They canceled the project. Nobody got charged, fortunately. Uh, and and then they were like, well, we really need to find a partner that can help with that. I have I have a customer um, that is is a great referral source of mine. That a software company in Buffalo. I do a lot of business with that uh, their line is sometimes you need to have a grown up in the room, right? You need that subject matter expert, right? If I'm talking software stuff, I, I, I know the buzzwords. I know enough to be dangerous, but I need somebody that's a subject matter expert to really go through it. And so Indiegogo and Arrow teamed up together with some of our other companies to put together this program where we actually do a certification process uh, where we certify that, yes, this is a real product. We can make it. We have the technology. We can, we have the funding. We can make this happen. We can build a $6 million man. Um, and yeah, I haven't updated any of my stuff since the eighties. So but Steve Austin, that's right. So at least somebody's here with me. That's good. <laughs> Everybody else is like, when's the reboot happening? I don't know. So, but we also do flash funding with them. So if you are in, either an active campaign, or if you're in the in-demand store, you can uh, you can set up to receive up to $150,000 in a monthly giveaway. So we give away like 1.2 million a year. Um, that is just flash funding. It's, it's not an exchange for equity. It's just, we wanna put it to you to help spurn you on to more. Um, and the various phases that we have, so what, wherever you are, we've got different things that can help you in the different areas with Indiegogo. Again, you with product launch, uh, looking at um, supply chain management to make sure that you can get the parts in because I don't think there's ever been a hardware project that has come out on time. I don't know if you guys have ever backed any crowdfunded stuff, but um, usually they're late unless it's a wallet or something that's CNC, right? So it's something that I like and, and I like to help companies grow with. I've had two Buffalo companies go through this process. No, three. Um, three of them. One isn't ready to keep going, but they've gotten certified. Another one just had a uh, project that got fully funded. They raised, I want to say about $12,000 out of the 10000 that they needed to get going through. And then another one that raised over $100,000, and we actually put 75000 into them uh for a project last summer so uh and we get you extra engineering support there's marketing support ibm and adi come along and help get you um more support into the stuff that they have uh into those networks and this is just another retelling up from before and then this is a couple projects uh in different areas for stuff that we've done. MakerBot has been around for a long time. When they were getting going, we were integral in getting them started. Frymaster is something that McDonald's and, and fast, fast food restaurants use. That's a smart interconnected system. This actually tells you when uh, the oil needs to be changed. So you have fresh fries and not fish fry fries, right? Uh, a smart pill for life sciences. This is an ingest, ingestible tracker uh, for that. And then smart cities is something that we do a ton with. And one of the big keys with smart cities is it can't just be one village that does it. You need to have the surrounding towns getting integrated in and getting a plan together. Yes. Yeah. Who is ingesting that tracker? Is that actually being used? Yes. Yeah. It's very uh, no, it's uh, something that just you you swallow it and then it passes through your system within a few days. It's, 
Yeah, it's a radioactive, radioactive element. That not radioactive. Be no. If it's be seen by a scanner, is that one? I don't know. I'm looking. Okay. But, but whatever it is, if I swallow that, someone can track it. Well, this would be like yeah. doctors doing it, not hey, the government right, coming, right. trying to find a lost prisoner. I swallowed a tracer once and had a scan, and they said it come out, but there's other drugs that they implanted you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then there's there's a company in Buffalo called Effort Labs, that their original idea was basically an implantable microscope for cancer patients because it would uh, detect, it, it would give you more direct impact on what the chemotherapy is, because chemotherapy is just vicious on your body, right? So you can dial it in a lot better if you can see what the cells are doing. Uh, but they found that it's actually been a bigger impact in the veterinary circles um, than trying to get to human trials. <laughs> yeah, you know, nobody cares about a rat or a dog uh, when you tell them that you're helping them. Right, this is just, but that's how we think, right? We, I, I'm not, not to have my political things going, but that's just how we seem to think and it's so much easier to pass through. Uh, so I don't know. Um, so yeah, um, there's funky stuff happening in science. In biosciences, yeah. So this specifically is a smart meter that can integrate in with an app. And there's actually a company that was here in Syracuse with Startfast uh, that the meter would be integrated into the cloud and be able to tell you where you had open parking spots so that you could like reserve it ahead of time and get in. So Ithaca has it? Um, in Buffalo, I use Buffalo Room. See, I do talk about Buffalo a lot. So, you know, it's almost like I'm a transplant. Ah. Um, so that's one, that's just one thing that IPS does. Us as a whole, there's camera integration uh, that helps with like street light controls. So you can vary when your red light, green light is going depending on the time of day, or if there's an accident, you can route traffic around it easier. Um, and then that also gets into building management, being able to turn lights off for conference rooms that aren't being used, uh, being able to get uh, broadband connectivity between the cities helps a lot in that. And that's why you need to have more than just like Syracuse do it, you need Casanova and all the surrounding suburbs to do it. Because if you have smart lights here and then you go to dumb lights, well, you're just creating a traffic jam at that border. You need smart lights going all the way through. Uh, and we can also do that with street lights that are going to be more sensitive to when there's more traffic or it can change depending on like the time of day or the day of the week. You can have a different light being cast depending on whether you have more walkers. Like, hey, it's, it's, we have whatever event like an East Ave event or whatever, and you have a lot of foot traffic, you want to have a different dispersal of light versus cars driving by, you want to have a different beam sensitivity. So um, you've got all those different types of variables and they're really huge projects to get into, but they're a lot of fun. So, yeah. And then my favorite thing about this slide is actually the notes that are on it. Um, complicated drawing meant only to demonstrate that Arrow has multiple partners in each of the nine, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, big picture. This means that we have a lot of people on our line card. And, you're, and you can see that it's not just the hardware guys over here. They, microchip is actually a brand, like Rollerblades and Kleenex, right? Microchip is a specific brand. Uh, STTE, they also build microchips, but microchip is microchip. Uh, and then we, we've got uh, cellular capabilities. We do stuff that's up in the cloud, being able to work with uh, AWS, Azure, IBM, and the like. And you can see Oracle and Splunk. Splunk is really cool because they do a lot of data harvesting and data, data scraping on a lot of different systems. So it's pretty savvy. And then 
How do I get my clicky? <laughs> Come on. You're on mirroring, which is a pain. That's all right. Okay. So the reason I put some of these websites up, and you'll have, you have it in the presentation, because if you want to go and play around with stuff, you can. And these guys, uh, a lot of the manufacturers I use love to give stuff away to people that have ideas. So it's not for you to go buy this. It's for you to pitch me your idea, and I give you one. Right? That's a way better way to do it. So this is called the Rapid IoT. Oh, sweet. <laughs> um, I was worried it might change that, or you right? Uh, so it's this little box that has wireless connectivity in it. And these guys give you everything you need to start hacking away on it and develop a new whoopee, for lack of a better phrase, a, a new thing that you can do whatever with. And as we go through, you can see that it gives you specs on it. There's the software package that's with it. Um, and with most of these, I've got one other one that I'm going to show before I demo. Um, there's going to be whatever whatever is uh, the software, like uh, the next one uses ST Cube, which is their proprietary thing for configuration. And then you can take basically C++, C++ or better. So if you're using JavaScript, Expresso, whatever it is to write your code and then embed it on the system to get access to the environmentals and digitizing the data. Um, and this has just been a really snazzy one that we've used. It has a battery built into it, a rechargeable battery built into it. Wi-Fi has a screen on it. So uh, there's tons of information that, they, that they'll give you on the documents side of it. There are videos to help you out. It's really snazzy. The other one I actually brought a sample of. Try the right arrow. Oh. Uh, and then this one is ST. SD micro. Uh, try going. Yeah. There I am. So they actually have training classes with this. You know, you guys are just finishing up this 24 week course. So let's do another course. Uh, uh, and so that you can get more uh, in depth knowledge with embedded systems. And let's see, if I go back one. No, and uh... Oh, too far. They've actually got a breakout of some of the projects that people have done. And there's one that people did that was kind of nest like. There it goes. go. There it is. Okay, cool. It's hard to do this when you're not looking at the mouse pad. <laughs> I highlight everything. Uh, the one I thought was really cool that somebody did here, it was a team of fifth graders with teacher oversight. They did like this whole crosswalk thing. Unfortunately, I can't make it larger, but you can see a little kid has a stick with green lights on it. When he holds it this way, it's green lights. When you go sideways, it wasn't letting me see full screen. All right, fine. Double click. <laughs> and then he turns it sideways and it switches to red. So this is a crosswalk project that some fifth graders figured out how to code up an accelerometer with some LEDs and it'll switch colors as he's turning it around. So there is teacher oversight. These guys aren't directing the buses. <laughs> but yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. And then it switches over to green. The miracle will be getting you back to your slides. <laughs> wow. All right. Hey, no, not yet. <laughs> They'll start asking things. Okay, so the demo that I had is this little guy here that is called a sensor tile. It should. It should just mirror up. <laughs> so there's an app that's connected with this little guy. 
no blinky light. I have your main demonstrator. You okay. got volatile, so it gives you the ambient temperature, humidity, uh, the barometric pressure, and then we can go over into other phases. That now, if you pick it up and slowly rotate it around. I probably didn't follow directions. All right, put it back down a sec and, and, and tap on the desk. Okay, tap on the desk. Oh, uh, now you walk too far away. Well, it, it stopped blinking after you said it. Well, that's it. okay. Blinking is not that important, I don't think. <laughs> no, I did. I broke it. <laughs> this is why you never do live demos when money's on the line <laughs> and you just do a video of how you did it good i set this up at home i made sure it worked <laughs> i did it over there again made sure i connected left it on didn't turn anything off We'll see if it pops up or it'll just, you know, they say it's like working with pets and children. They're always. I also have three engineers that I get to pull and get support on. So when you have technical questions, I'm just a sales guy. I talk numbers and they're the ones that do actually all the hard stuff. So. Right. Be blinky, that's good. Stay blinky. Oh, look, there's right there. All right. So, so it's 25 degrees Celsius. That means it's hot and sweaty in here. <laughs> So you can have like a virtual game of craps. <laughs> yay, stay guys. Uh, and then this one I think is cool because you can have it as a motion detector. So basically this one little chip that this guy costs $35. Um, <laughs> you know, nobody has epilepsy, right? I'm not gonna trigger <laughs> anything. Um, cost $35 and you could set this up as the basis for like a home security system if you had a cool idea to integrate in with other stuff uh and being able to have the motion sensor there's also you can also do log tracking uh and the most important one every demo has to have this turn on a light <laughs> proves it works so yeah that that's uh st sensor tile now what does this mean in the real world how does this translate into doing something more than turning on a light? Is that Clay Winfield? She's a student joining uh, oh, okay. remotely. Well, she's late. Uh, and then just swap the HMI over. Yeah. But you're looking at the screen, like you have confidence <laughs> I had already switched it. I was like, so one of the companies I'm working with in uh, Rochester, is third eye design and this is actually a well actually it's just this thing that goes on a motorcycle helmet yeah. so you can put it on somebody else's or you know you can switch it between them um and it has a module that where'd i go So there's a module that goes on the bike that uh, goes into uh, where the brake lights and turn signals are because it will also stop highlighting. It'll give you blinkers. 
It gives you full brake light. And it'll also detect if you're stopped long enough. Uh, even if you're like, if you're at a light, you've got the clutch box, so you don't have the brakes on, but you're still, it's gonna be flashing that. So, and that's basically being able to take something like this and extend it out, put more LEDs with it and encasement and you're ready to go. So um, it's a company that I'm super excited about because I ride, so it matters to me. Being, being visible is the most important thing, so. Yeah. yeah. So they have like a little pock that has Velcro on it that sticks onto your helmet. And that way, if you've got multiple helmets or multiple riders, you can take that and switch it between them. And it's just this. And actually, if you have multiple bikes, you're okay as well. So when you turn both of them on, it syncs up and whichever one is the closest, it will sync to that. And if the two bikes say you're riding in a group, if the two bikes get more than 50 feet away, it will re-sync to whatever bike's closest. So if you have bike A and B and a helmet's crossed for some reason, because that can happen, they'll auto reconnect as you ride, which is cool. So, and that's, that's that. So any questions, comments, concerns, views on scroll, please. So the kind of cool thing about hardware and, and how it's evolved is 10 years ago, it took a half million dollars to get into hardware, right? And you had to have specific engineers and manufacturing was really expensive. Um, and the, the technology in the industry has really changed uh, to the point where you can have Indiegogos or Kickstarters and really get started with, with hardware. Um, one thing that I did while I was in college is I hated when the uh, professor would take attendance and pass around a sheet. And there would be 200 people in the lecture hall and one person would forget to pass it around. And um, so I thought, hey, there should be a, a solution for this, but I couldn't figure out how to do it with just software. Um, what's that? Did you do that I didn't do the clicker. Oh, so no, um, I started using hardware similar to that called Beacons. Um, and the idea was that you could give a professor a $30 beacon that they could throw in their briefcase or their, their purse or whatever. Um, and then the students, as soon as they walked into the room, it would detect the proximity to the beacon and check them in over Bluetooth. Um, and I did a lot of experimentation with that and the professors all loved it because within a minute or two of every student walking into the classroom, you knew immediately who was there. Um, and that was something that you couldn't just do with software, right? You could, the student could spoof being uh, in the building with GPS or even connected to the Wi-Fi network. Um, so it was really cool to kind of bridge that gap between software and hardware. Um, and that's not something that I would have been able to do 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, I would have had to uh, partner with a hardware company and, and invest a lot of money into custom hardware. But now between Raspberry Pis and Bluetooth sensors and all kinds of really cool stuff, uh, projects that are, would not normally be accessible are becoming something that a software developer who might not be an expert in hardware can dive into. Yeah. Yeah, and Raspberry Pis, even though they're not great for production, they are great as a gateway to get into stuff and to get a proof of concept. Uh, between that and 3D printers, you can say, I made a new thing, and it's something that you can go around and show people, look, I did a thing, and it makes it and does that. Yeah, we need to make it prettier before we sell it, but I can show you and give you something tangible that you can hold on to, right? Uh, and then from there, you can go into, okay, the, the the downside, the only downside of Raspberry Pi is that it's open source, so their board can change without notifications. Uh, so that makes it very hard to take it to production when you're going to make like five, ten, fifty thousand of them at a time, right? When you're making thousands of them, you can't have a firmware change like like that. Uh, but to get your proof of concept, tons of my guys start there, and then we get them into something like this transition it over there are lots of tools that you can take your code and switch and help it to switch over a lot easier um, and get you into something more stable so yeah how, how would you learn what's even possible like you know like what's available like 
Like, I don't know yeah. anything about. Right. And, and for us, we have almost a thousand different manufacturers on our line card. That's a ton of, and each manufacturer could have, you know, thousands of products. So how everybody has their favorite things that they use. But if you lay out, okay, I want a thing that does this. I need to know what the temperature is. I need to know if there's movement, right? Just like you're going to have a flow chart when you're writing a program. It's what, what are the, what are the real world inputs that you want to take or what is the digital that you want to output? And then talking to us at that point, uh, you, it can't be too early to talk to us. Um, it, and people are always like, oh, I'm not ready yet. I, all I have is the napkin drawing. No, we're fine with the napkin. Uh, and we can help take you from there into like a real thing. Uh, money helps at certain points, but I'll buy you lunch. I don't care. Right. That, that's my job is to find the next big, the next cool thing. Uh, and to just turn through those ideas. So, yeah. Yes. And sometimes before they have patents. That's really crazy. Uh, yes and no, because uh, from we we can do NDAs, and I, I have a boilerplate NDA. And, you know, if you have yours that you want to use, I'll send it to my legal team, right? Uh, and, well, I say that because one time I, I had a customer's NDA, and I sent it up to our legal department and I said, well, this is really for their customers going downstream. It doesn't properly cover people upstream from where the design is, right? So I got to do some educating on different types of NDAs then. Um, but the reality, I see so many different things that I, I don't know who is patented and who's not. Um, if, if you want to do an NDA, we can definitely get that in place and then keep moving forward from there. The other crazy thing about patents is they are strictly ideas, right? So you hear about Apple, uh, doing these patents all the time and people are like, oh, we're going to have a, an iPad with a flexible screen or whatever. And it's like, no, Apple doesn't even have to make it. All they have to do is prove that this idea, no one else has had it and patented it. So you can patent things that you haven't written a line of code for, that you haven't done any hardware design for. If you have the money to pay an attorney and no one else has had the idea, you can get a patent. So my Buffalo guys. That's true. Yes. Yeah. If, if you can go through the paperwork, then you can, you can sell patent a lot of stuff. My guy in Buffalo that has that implantable microscope. He actually has a patent on, on a body network. So if you had multiple connected devices, I don't know, your replacement hip has a sensor that, I don't know. Um, he has a patent on like networking products in a body, which sounds really cool. Yeah, it's very cyborg-y, yeah. <laughs> so. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, well, it's all customer driven. So it, it's whatever we come across. It's not anything that we are creating. So, yeah. It, but medical is a huge vertical. It's everybody from like Welch Allen, uh, Johnson & Johnson, all the way through Phillips. Um, yeah. So any, any other questions? Any ideas? <laughs> I have dev kits that work mostly reliably <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, so for the person who came to you with the idea on the napkin, yeah. you like just never said, like, another napkin. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's going to be a couple <laughs> napkins before you get there. Oh, I broke it. <laughs> Is this why you can't have a Mac? Uh, so it's Microsoft products. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. So, is there a slide you want to go to? Yeah, wait up, yep. up, 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 right that one. Yeah, this guy. So, somebody that has a nap, a, a, a napkin idea, then we can look at engaging application engineers. Those are guys that I have in house that don't cost you anything. We can help you with guidance if that's good enough for you and you're courageous enough to do it on your own or looking at somebody that can do a uh, third-party design, either turnkey, FPGA design, depending on what 
it is that you're going to be working off of or a third party design. We have a program called ACES, which is Aero Certified Engineering Services. Uh, basically, you need 30 pages of acronyms to be a real company. <laughs> we have that. So, but in our ACES programs, we actually have uh, two locally. We've got D3 Engineering in Rochester and Critical Link that's out here in Syracuse. That, that's all they do is design per contract. Right, so if you take it, if we have, we get a statement of work together and say, this is the, the boundaries of what we want to develop and what we want to do. And it can include everything from the software, hardware, up to industrial design. Or again, if you guys have somebody, no, no, no. My, my buddy's an industrial designer. He's going to do what it looks like on the outside. I'm going to do the software. I need somebody that does the bits and pieces that go on the rainbow. Um, they can do that. So the, the scope of work, you're going to be determining um, how much they do. And then it's going to depend on how complicated it is, uh, what that price looks like going forward, right? It could be it could be something, and I recommend doing it in steps too. Don't do, okay, step one, the whole thing. That's going to be $500,000, right? Or you have step one that gets you so a step farther than where you are, and that could be like ten to fifty thousand dollars. And then we need to go to that next level, and we're gonna bite off more, right? We get more funding, more investments, or we've got letters of intent and pre-sales. Uh, then you can just go for that next step of design, make it more fit, polish, finish, right? Um, and you just kind of step your way through there. You take smaller chunks going through. So before I got to the Bluetooth phase of my attendance project, um, I thought I, would, I could make a swiper where students could just swipe their student ID cards in when they walked in the room. Um, and so I got started with Raspberry Pi, right? Was not making a ton of these, um, but I had a, an LCD that I wanted just a screen to put on top of it. And it was the, what you see on like vending machines, right? Um, and I got the kit and I didn't read the description and I had to solder it all together. And I was yeah. like, I can write code. I don't know how to solder, right? So I got on YouTube, I started doing that. Um, and I got to the point where I actually got it all working and it looked like a, a microchip Frankenstein kind of thing. There are all these things together. I didn't know how to get power to it. I didn't know how I was going to build the case. So got out my Velcro and started literally sticking things together. Uh, and then I got into 3D printing, right? And I figured out how to build a case and how to have a little cutout for the screen and where the swiper would attach. And um, I gave it to some professors that looked at it and thought I was crazy. But sure enough, they plugged it in and jumped on the Wi-Fi network and they could swipe students in, right? So it's this really exciting thing when you can take your code outside of just your development environment and make that jump into hardware. Um, and Hack Upstate, which is coming up in a couple months, is, is a, a great place to kind of play around with that. And have these ideas, even if you've never gotten into hardware, and come in and talk to Josh and say, hey, I'm trying to get this done. How am I going to do this? What kind of device can I use? Yeah. I got states at last. It's a lot of fun. So, <laughs> I'm in for the shirt stuff. You know, my wife needs a new shirt now. Uh, they're so soft. It is like the softest <laughs> t-shirt ever. They're great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. It's Hack it, Up State is a good group of people. I really have enjoyed being able to support them and come to the different events. And, uh, and again, that's mostly programming. But every once in a while. There are some high school kids that made a hologram. That was Garnet. He is. And I, I met him. I'm the one that brought him into the event. <laughs> no big deal. The, but those kids, him and Garnet and, and his other buddy, what's his other friend's name? Because there are three of them, and two of them are yeah. just like off the chart brilliant. Um, that third one, though. But that third one, <laughs> well, no, he's the business guy. I talked with him, and he's he's like, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. I'm like, okay, so you're going to make money, and these guys are going to be working for you. Okay. So. Hipster and hustler. Yeah, you got, you got to balance. It's all about balance. But they literally did, like, um, it, it was very simple. It was a cardboard box that had flexi over it in a certain way that they were taking a feed from their phone 
to cast an image onto the box and through the mirrors, it looked like a 3D hologram. And they had a dragonfly on it and they were moving it back and forth and shrinking and growing. And it looked like it was moving around. It was the craziest thing. The simplest thing out of cardboard, right? Because Google, Google did their VR, the Google cardboard, right? Sometimes cardboard can really blow you away on what it can do. <laughs> and these guys were just so inventive. I, I, I was blown away by them. So it's always fun when they show up. Yeah. I uh, had an idea. I went to Home Depot the other day, ordered something online, and they have their their locker system, right? And it looks like a little iPad on the the uh, lockers, and you walk up with a QR code on your phone, and it pops open the locker door for you. So, like, I was walking in with my phone, I barely had the QR code up, and all of a sudden the door pops open, and I pick up my thing, and I'm like, wow, wouldn't that re be really awesome if I had that on my garage? So when people walked up, I get emails with the tracking number. What if I could build some software to pull those tracking numbers out? And whenever the UPS or USBS guy comes, they just hold up the box and it opens my garage door. And so that is my hack upstate project. No one steal it. But I will be talking to Josh on uh, on like what kind of barcode scanners can I use? How do I get it connected to the internet? What kind of hardware, right? All of that kind of stuff is is just crazy ideas that can make an impact and could eventually be turned into a business. So there's this guy, you might've heard of him, Jeff Bezos. Um, <laughs> that that's what, that's actually the thing that they're trying to develop yep. is, is to be able to get their UPS drivers being able to get access to deliver packages in their garages and you yep. can do it better, cheaper, whatever. I, I run into a lot of people that are like, Oh, I have an idea to do this. I'm like, Oh, you mean like what these guys are doing? Oh, that idea is already out there. I can't do it. No, <laughs> do it differently, do it better, do it cheaper, do it sexier, and it can work, right? And, and it can happen. Fa like I said, Facebook isn't the first one. There are all these iterations before that. Facebook's not the last one. There's going to be something else afterwards, right? Or just do it for the sake of learning, right? Like there's nothing wrong with doing a project that doesn't turn into a business. Yeah. I learned so much doing that attendance project and starting with the Raspberry Pi and kind of evolving it from there. It's not a business. I'm not making money off of it, but it was, I learned a lot doing that. And then you might, and you'll use those skills for something else down the road and you build on that. And it might be your fifth project that yep. ends up being, you think I learned all these skills and now I can do this and I'm going to make this other thing that is totally different than where I started with. So, uh, and that's where I get the value is, you know, I don't know if any idea from either hack or anything else from even doing this is going to be the next Ephesus, $150 million company, right? But it might be, or it might be the next company you work with. Or if I talk to enough people, I'll find somebody that does that. Or I just get a build into your passion, right? And, and support what you're enjoying, what you're, what you're learning about. So that's, that's where my value comes in, I guess. Yeah. Does that sound good? Did I talk long enough? <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, just a quick question. For the sensor tile, do you have to get the whole connectable, the sensor tile kit, or can you just use the tile will it work? So this one is, um, this, this has everything that you need, because this is the baseboard that you can plug into your computer to program off of. I'll bring it over, so. So there, there is a full blown kit. So this is a dev board that uh, is more robust and you would solder it onto that, uh, but it also gives you the battery and all that. But this version of it, all you need is that and it plugs onto here and then using a micro USB plugs into your computer and you program. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at what a computer is, you've got a processor, you've got memory and RAM, uh, and then you just have to figure out what your input and output is, right? So a keyboard is your input for a true computer, but you have sensors that are giving that input for you. And then the output can either be going up into the cloud or onto a display or whatever. So 
Yeah. And then there are more robust ones. I'd even consider this a computer at its core because it's doing, it has a processor and it does all that same stuff. Um, and then there are more robust ones that are actually called single board computers, F, single board computers, SBCs, um, that have way more power on them. Uh, and that can act as like a gateway or a bridge um, for taking in signals, processing them. And like you can have something that comes in over Bluetooth and then you send it out over Wi-Fi to get up into the cloud. And that you need a little bit more processing power to do than uh, something like a Disgrade or a Raspberry Pi. But yeah, I, and there, there's also arcade um, rips that you can do that show you how to build like a little arcade machine off of a Raspberry Pi and play like Atari 2600 games on it. So, yeah. Raspberry Pi started 30 bucks. We also have a lot. We have like five, I think. So, I'll get out of one hardware. Sure. Thanks, Ash. Gonna try. Actually, I'm not gonna try. I'm gonna start with a video. <laughs> um, so, um, quick rundown of the schedule. Um, tomorrow, go right to CoWorks at 5:30 like normal. Um, we will be attending Code for Syracuse, um, which I think is gonna be an awesome program, and I think it will get the gears turning for you guys about involvement after uh, careers in code. Um, I hear time and time again how employers are looking at GitHubs for, for portfolios and for resumes. And um, it can be really tough working on uh, your own small little project. Uh, but at places like, uh, at places like uh, Code for Syracuse, you get to be in a team environment. And not only do you get to accomplish something, but you get to accomplish something that gets eyes on it, right? That gets media attention. And then all of a sudden you have an in or you get to say, hey, I'm, I'm that person. I was just in the news for a project that I completed. Um, so I think it's going to be um, a really great meeting tomorrow. Um, that runs from 6 to 7.30. Um, so the first half hour of class I'm going to use is kind of a spillover for anything that we don't get done tonight. Um, and then uh, the remaining hour or so we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll kind of play that by ear if we have uh, more capstone stuff that we want to focus on or just use that as kind of an open office hours. Um, I have uh, two things that I want to get through this week and the rest I am going to leave open for capstone time to do focus on project setup and then implementing everything that we did this week in your actual capstones. Um, the two things that I'm going to cover um, are password hashing and how encryption works with the password, how to build out that whole system. Um, and then the other thing we're going to use is something called Firebase, which is kind of like a plug and play solution uh, where you can go, I don't want to deal with passwords. I just want to drop in a, a pre-built solution and use that. Uh, so we're going to cover those two. Um, when we start with passwords here uh, shortly, uh, we are going to start from a completely blank project. And the reason why we're going to do that is so you guys can follow along and see how you get up and running. And we're going to do it in uh, the stack that we've already been working with, right? So we're going to be doing um, Node, Express, uh, Postgres, SQLize, and React on the front end. Um, and so we're going to go through all those steps. We're going to get that project up and running. Um, we could kind of cheat and we could use a starter or another project, but I think there's a lot of value in getting comfortable in the terminal, getting comfortable, getting it set up and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're gonna dive into that. Um, we are not going to get through everything today and that's all right. We have plenty of time to get through this stuff. Um, so uh, that's today and tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we'll probably just do Firebase, and then Thursday is going to be completely open-ended. 
Um, I did drop a link for the outline for today. If anyone has notes that they want to throw in there, please do so. Um, also throw any questions you have in there. So office hours, I'm gonna do a little different on Friday. Um, we're gonna do them Friday at 5.30, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer any questions that are in these outlines throughout the week, um, or if you throw any in Thursday or, or, or Friday. And I'm gonna kind of just punch through those questions and then I'll leave the rest of the time open for any capstone questions that you guys may have. Yeah, so we're covering uh, authentication and authorization. Um, so basically just creating a login system. And the way we're gonna start is actually with the least secure. Uh, well, first we're gonna set up the project, right? And we're gonna go through and get the whole stack working. Um, then we're gonna start with the least secure and just getting an auth system that works and work our way up to the most secure. Um, so uh, I know it's 642. Um, and we're bordering on a, a break. Um, so uh, I'm gonna play this video and then we will um, take a break and then we'll get our project set up uh, once we get back. Okay. Yes. Before you start the video, yes. have your screen for sharing. Thank you. Okay, that should fix that. All right. Any questions before we dive into this video? Well, that's okay. We don't need to hear it, right? Uh, let's see if I can get it working through the TV speakers. Oh, perfect. The title of this, uh, this video should be, can, can we have this? The title of this video should be, How Not to Store Passwords. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, because you, you really shouldn't store passwords yourself if you can at all avoid it. If you are running any kind of web service and, and you are storing passwords, it is so incredibly easy to get it wrong uh, that basically you shouldn't try. <laughs> If you can use sign in with Facebook or Twitter or Google and get them to handle it for you, for crying out loud, please do. Which we will with Firebase, by the way. If you're a web programmer, sooner or later, you're going to have to store passwords. And this is, this is the, the ways not to do it. If you want to know the ways to do it, I will kind of say that at the end. But for, please, 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 please look up a recent tutorial for the language you're using. Um, by the time you watch this video, the advice will have changed. You may be watching this years in the future. Look up a tutorial that's been written in the last few months by someone reputable and follow that. How do you not store passwords? The first instinct, the naive thing, is just store the user's password. So let's say you have a sign-up box and you have a you know, username and password box. So the naive thing is that when the user signs up, you take their password, and you store it in the database as it is in plain text. That has a couple of advantages. First of all, if they forget their password, you can just email it to them. Uh, and it means that you know, checking it is really simple. When they log in again, you take their username, you take their password, and then you take what they've just typed, you compare it to what's in the database, and if it matches, you let them in. And that is the, the naive approach to storing passwords. And there are still professional websites out there run by big corporations that still use this strategy. And you can tell that they're using this strategy because they email your password back to you in plain text when you ask for it. Um, this is a monumentally bad idea. So I've had that happen. I have contacted a company and said, hey, I forgot my password. And they go, sure, what's your email? And over the phone, they go, oh, your password is ABC123. And I'm like, I didn't verify anything. I didn't give you any other information. You didn't even email that to me. You just, you know, called me up or I called you and you gave me the password. So Apple had a situation like this a couple of years ago. Um, and there was a big uh, celebrity nude photo leak, right? Um, and the, the way the person got in wasn't, <laughs> what? I said, yeah, like I remember. 
you looked at me like, oh, did you enjoy that? No, I didn't. So, it was a horrible day. So, what happened was um, Apple was very secure. Apple had um, not been pushing two factor authentication like they had been. Um, and someone called up Apple and said, hi, I'm celebrity, you know, so-and-so, I forgot my password, can you help me reset it? Um, and they didn't have the strictest uh, policies in place. So Apple themselves reset the password and let this hacker into these celebrities' uh, accounts. Apple has obviously since changed a lot of their policies. Um, they now enforce two-factor authentication, which would solve a lot of these, these issues. Um, everyone know what two factor is the, the little code that you get on your phone and you type in. Um, but there are, uh, that is called social engineering or social hacking, where all of a sudden you're not using technology to hack into someone's account or crack their password. You're just trying FIDO and, and the year they were born as their password and getting into the accounts. Right. Um, so, uh, if you do, I have called companies before and I said, please delete me from your database. Like I got the email, my password came back in plain text. I want nothing to do with you guys because not only is that password stored in plain text, but they also have my email address as well. So they can take that password and that email address and go sign in to any other account of mine that shares that same password and now get access to a lot of different things. So please use password managers, whether it's 1Password, whether it's Dashlane, whether it is, um, I'm blanking on the others, uh, LastPass, whatever it is, use different passwords for every service because these leaks happen. And the next thing that they're going to cover is what happened to Adobe. And Adobe got their entire password database released with the email address. So all of a sudden they can sign in to any service that reuses that username and password. But this is, this is an astonishingly bad idea because if someone gets into your database through a security hole or because they're an insider with access, and let's be honest, if you're storing passwords this way, you probably have other security holes too, um, then they can just read out every user and their password. So you have their email address and you have their password. And let's be honest, most people reuse the same password for their email address on So this is a bad idea because it's incredibly insecure. Approach number two, slightly less naive, still a bad idea, is you take that password and you uh, encrypt it. So you, you hide it uh, behind something. And encryption is two-way. So encryption is something that you have a key that will lock something and then unlock it again. So the naive approach is you take the user's password, you take it into your database, encrypt it like this behind you know, the thing you've locked, and then, let's change his hand, when they log in again, you take what they've got, you go here, you unlock this, you compare them, and then you let them in. Now that's a little bit more secure because if someone just reads out the database, you've got an encryption key there, it's got a couple of big flaws. First of all, as soon as that key is available, the password's still visible and can still be read out. And it means that an insider, or even a hacker in some cases, can just take the encryption key as well with them, and they've still got access to all the passwords. That's a pretty bad idea. The other flaw with this is that if you have lots of people using the same password, and if you've got a big site, this will happen because lots of people will use one, two, three, four, five, six, or password one. And if I've just said either of your YouTube passwords, don't change it. <laughs> if you have that, all the encryption will be the same. So even if you don't have the encryption key, you can still tell that all these people have the same password. So it's probably a common one. Adobe just made this mistake this month. Uh, as we record this, and don't get a big company behind uh, Acrobat, which makes PDFs, uh, behind Photoshop, behind all the big tools, millions and millions and millions of users, their password database got breached. Gigabytes of passwords lost. But it's fine, they said. Yours? Yeah, mine was as well. Fortunately, I didn't use that password anywhere else, which is what you should hopefully be doing. Their passwords were encrypted. And that was it, it was just a, you know, a lock on it. 
and it meant that everyone who had the same password had the same encrypted code. So there are two points to make here. If you're, if you're using an encryption key, right, that's two ways. So you put some encrypted data in the database, and if you have the right key, if you have the right password, you can unencrypt all of that information as well. So that means it's two ways. You can e encrypt it and decrypt it. So what they're saying here is that when they took the, the password database, all they had to do was crack one master key to get access to the millions of usernames and passwords. Um, the other thing what they're saying here is that if I use password one as my password and encrypt that with some key and five other people use the password password one, all they need to do is crack that one time and they just gained access to five different users' accounts. So. Unfortunately, they'd also stored all the password hints with them, which is, which is wonderful because then you can look, oh look, there's 20 people who use the same password here. And that one says Michael Jackson is the password hint. And that one says Halloween. And that one says type of movie. Oh look, it's Thriller. Okay, wonderful, it's Thriller. Um, and, that was, and that's one of the biggest software companies in the world didn't do this properly. Um, anyway, so don't use encryption. Naive attempt number three. Don't use that type of encryption. <laughs> Hashing. Now, I've talked about this in an earlier video. Um, a hash is a summary of a load of data. So let's say you have um, the password the user enters, and you know that you know, when they enter it, you're going to hash it. And you're going to put it through some kind of convolutions that ends up like that. And then when the user enters their password again, you take it in the same way, compare, they're the same, which is great in theory, but unfortunately leaves you open to the same problem that Adobe has which is that if you can tell a common password, if it's in a load of people's database entries, you probably can work out what it is. Worse than that, as I've said before, Google has an index of these things. If you're using a basic hashing algorithm, you can pretty much just type the code into Google and it will give you the password back. As well as just searching for common hashes on Google, uh, there are these things called rainbow tables, um, which trade off computation time for hard drive space. So rather than having to calculate millions and millions of hashes for this one password, someone has already done it for you. Um, calculated, pass calculated hashes for billions of common passwords and just put them out in the database. It's gigabytes long, but it's a lot easier to search through that than it is to try and do a load of calculation. So rainbow table, the idea here, right, is that a bunch of people have the password password, but it costs a lot of money. It's, it's, they call it expensive. Uh, because it takes CPU usage to take the word password and make a hash out of it. So what they do is they take all of these very common passwords and the entire English dictionary, and they run all of the hashes for that once. And so they find out that password uh, hashes always return the same thing. That's why they work. So whenever I hash password using a certain algorithm, uh, it's going to return one, two, three. Right? And if it's password one, it's going to return one, two, three, four. And it doesn't matter how many people have reused that, the hash is always the same. So they figure this out. Hey, if I hash these thousand most uh, popular passwords, I can store those hashes and then just try the hash directly instead of having to use my CPU to look up all of those things uh, and rehash it. So that's the rainbow table is take, uh, take a thousand hashes that we've already calculated, store the passwords with them, and if the two hashes match, we now know what that user's password is. So if you're using something common, like uh, MD5 or SHA1, with nothing else added, um, the rainbow table will pretty much help you track that in a few seconds. I have, in the past, used all those naive approaches myself on, on things I've built in my youth. Um, I've gone back and fixed them where they're still alive and, and just sort of quietly buried the code where, uh, where they worked. But the approach nowadays is to use something called hashing and consulting. As I said, the best thing is not to store passwords at all, but if you have to, the, the advice these days is hash salt. So a salt is a random string of characters uh, that is different for every single user. It's a password you know in your database. You can store it in plain text, it doesn't matter. 
the user could even know it, not to be able to help them with anything. That means when the user registers, they put their password in. And it goes into the same algorithm, but as well as that, you generate a random string of characters for each user, completely random. A new second password, if you like, that goes in the database. And that gets fed into this algorithm too. So that comes in, mutates it a bit more, comes out with something else. So if another user uses the same password, that algorithm will get a completely different salt from them. Um, some people might, based on the username, that's generally a bad thing to do. It should just be a, a random string of characters. So the same password going in for a different user will mutate into something entirely different. The point of this is that now you just have a random string for each user. You cannot possibly pull the password back from this. It won't appear in Google because it's a massively long random string. You can't brute force it back by looking at what common passwords are reused. All you can do is do the old style attack of trying every single common password one after the other. And if your salt's long enough and your hashing algorithm's complicated enough, then that's really incredibly difficult to do. Do it right, and it's lifetime of the universe difficult to do. Or at least it is until they use the password one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. If you change one button. Um, this guy has a bunch of cool videos. I will post this in the outline. Um, I'm going to try and congregate all of the resources we use tonight in one Google Doc so you guys can actually find it without having to scroll for ages. Um, I will share this, but for right now, we are going to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we are going to start from scratch, and basically I'm going to recreate the video that I posted earlier last week on how to do the whole project setup, get your backend working, connect to a database, get SQLize working, get React, that stuff. So even if that's the only thing we cover in encryption tonight, uh, at least we will have our project set up for tomorrow um, and we'll be able to uh, kind of dive in from there. Okay, great time. See you guys in like 15-ish minutes, 7.15.
Okay. All right. So we are going to dive in here. Um, I did send the link out for the outline. Uh, if you want to add any notes into there to share with the class, please do. Um, everyone should have edit access. Okay. Um, so we are going to start from scratch. So we are going to pop open Visual Studio Code. And oh, all my code. We are going to go to a new window and pop open a terminal and blow it up. Okay, so uh, I want to CD to my desktop. Uh, I want to go into my projects folder and the CIC repo. I'm going to CD again to my name. Anyone has questions at any point, just interrupt me. Um, and I'm going to MKDIR and I'm going to call it off day one, or I'm just going to call it off day. Uh, and I will hit enter there. Uh, so now we made our directory. I'm going to CD into it. And I am going to create two folders in here. Actually, just one for now. I'm going to make my backend directory. So MKDIR backend. Um, I'm going to go back into the backend. A lot of CDs, a lot of MKDIRs. Now you could say, Max, why don't I just do this in Finder? And you totally could. Um, but now we're in here and we're going to start running commands that you definitely couldn't do in Finder. So while terminal doesn't feel comfortable or natural yet, um, it did not feel comfortable or natural for me my first year of development. And then I stopped fighting it and just started using it. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this makes sense. There are only like 10 different commands I need to know and terminal isn't that bad. Okay. Wait one second. Yep. So you're in a CIC repo. Yep. I CD'd That's into my name. name. Right. And then I created a new uh, directory for this project, which I called off day. So this, uh, I CD, I uh, MKDIR, which is make directory for off day. Yeah, I just want to create one in this folder called possibly 10, although it's not going to matter. Whatever. Um, so I said, you know, I'm in my desktop. Yep. And... Now, if you don't know where you are, you can PWD yeah, for your... Probably not. So here's my I have here oh, module 10 in my desktop. I know what your problem Already? is. Okay, go ahead. Please. You are dealing with the bane of every developer's existence. Okay. Spaces. Oh, spaces. So okay. a space in your in your file name, uh, when you type it in and hit enter, it's gonna say we can't find this file. Um, so when I create new folders, I always make sure uh, you notice I did off dash day here just because that's going to make it easier to get to. Um, what so you, I added a underscore yep. there. And now you should be able to CD. Uh, but see, careers in code while well, also has spaces. So you can use spaces in a terminal. And when you do use that, you're going to use the, the forward slash. So, or the backslash. I can never remember which one is which. The one right underneath the delete key. Um, I think that's the forward slash. So you're going to use forward slash and then type your space. And what that's telling the terminal is, hey, I'm, I'm not typing in a new command here. It's just my file name has a space in it. OK. Oh, I can't believe that was my whole problem. <laughs> now, if you hit tab, it's going to auto complete. So if okay. we just back that out a little bit and just hit tab, double tab or not. Um, are you in your, you're just in careers and code? Yeah, so then I want to go to module 10. Okay. And there's still a space right there. Oh, okay. So we're going to get rid of that space. And now if we hit tab, it's going to tell there you. It is. So okay. we'll hit it once, or we'll just type it in. All right, so now I'll just enter. Create it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's getting closer. Um, okay, so I'm in my back end. I'm going to NPM. Anyone? Anyone? What? Close. Init. init. Before I can install, I need to init. I need to create the package.json. 
so the server or so the it knows where to save packages that I'm installing. So I'm just going to enter, 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 enter. And now if I ls in this, I see that my package.json is created. Okay, good. We're getting started. So I'm going to cd back up. And instead of make dir for my uh, front end, I'm going to use create react app. And create react app is a little different. It's going to create that folder for me. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, create react app. Now, if you didn't have create react app installed, you would have to npm install create react app. Um, now this is somewhere where you can get trip, uh, tripped up. If you do dash G, you are saying install this globally. So don't install this just in my project folder, install this on my whole computer. Um, so when you're installing things, yes. So what's the difference between NPM and NPS? Uh, I know this one. NPS, you're not actually uh, actually downloading with your machine and reporting it into your project. I'm going to pretend like I know what NPX is. NPX create React app front end. Oh. Uh, not actually installing it. I think the whole neighborhood knows my voice just because how loud I am. Um, I do, I'm not familiar with uh, NPX, so I am going to uh, refrain from commenting on it. <laughs> um, so if we dash G, uh, we are globally installing it. Uh, and the computer is probably going to yell at you and you're going to get an EX or EAXIS or whatever it is. Uh, and it's going to go, whoa, we can't install that. The reason is because you're installing it at the entire computer's level, the Mac is trying to protect you and say, really only an admin should be doing that. So that's why you run the command with sudo, S-U-D-O, and that's the way you can remember it is it used to be for super user do. Um, and the reasoning behind that is now you are giving it uh, permission to run at the admin level, whatever command follows sudo. So it asks for your password, that's going to be your Mac password. And when you hit enter, then it will install properly because you're giving it super user access or admin access. Um, I'm guessing everyone has create react app installed. Um, if you uh, do not, you're going to get an error on this step and I will come around and help. Um, so I'm going to create React app and I'm going to call it front end. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to go through and install React in the 30,000 dependencies. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so you can run uh, sudo npm install dash g space create create react app with spaces in between it. And when you hit enter, it's going to ask you for your Mac password. When you type it in, it won't actually show up what you're typing. It is actually typing it. Um, Can you say that again? Because I'm actually kind of sure. Uh, that was sudo sudo uh -huh. space npm install install space dash G. Oh, dash G for global. Yep. Uh -huh. Space create dash react dash app. Okay. 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 Yeah. So that was after I that. So okay. I think, yeah. So if you, and even if you have it installed, like I already had it installed, you'll get this thing that says updated one package. That's also fine. So what we just did is we said, hey, we're going to be making a bunch of create React apps. So let's uh, install it globally so we can use it on our computer down the road, even if we're not in this specific directory. OK, so um, I'm going to ls. And I should have a folder that says back end and a folder that says front end. Is anyone not on that step? I have okay. that, but I got another OK. Just from doing npm start. Okay, so we're not in any directory yet. Uh huh. Um, so you would, you're ahead of me. <laughs> All right, 
Anyone have questions? Uh, I can't scroll up too far just because uh, Create React App does a bunch of different things. But I just ran create dash react dash app front end as and made sure that I was in my my project folder. Um, yes, in your own name. Okay. Unless someone complains, I'm moving forward. Speak now. Forever hold your peace. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have this set up. We are going to uh, open this workspace in Visual Studio Code. Um, I am working in off day. So I'm gonna just double click on that. Oh, I'm gonna file open, not open workspace and then open off day. Um, if you it just run open space dot slash and hit enter, it will open that folder. Um, I don't know what the command is to open it directly in Visual Studio Code. It might it might just be well. Let's let's see what happens if I cd one directory up and then do code space dot slash. You spell code right. VS code, maybe? Mm, I'm not sure how to open it directly. Um, I just go the old school way, file open. But if you find it, feel free to share it and, and put it in the notes. In what language? Uh, in, yeah. uh, <laughs> in what part of React? There are yeah. multiple answers. Command slash will. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I have my uh, back end and my front end. So I'm going to create a new file in my back end called index.js. Okay. Quick question. Yep. Have a JSON package in your because I ran npm init in the back end in the terminal. In the back end specifically, which is in the off day project. Okay. So the terminal is all about what file, what what path you're in. So we're gonna hit Control C, and we're gonna run PW. Did you make the index.js? I did. Okay. 
You want help? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Insert your uh, back end again, and then CD into it, and then SPM commit, and then turn your operator. I thought like that is something you can do. And then create the app map. Quick dive action. For those couple minutes, while I was doing something. Oh, and then just create uh, index.js in your back end. Okay. So we have our create React app set up, and we have our back end project kind of set up, but nothing installed. So how are we going to do that? npm install dev cache save body parser express and on a moment. Yep. So before we do that, we want to make sure we're CD'd into our backend. Um, and if you're ever not sure, um, I know I have my terminal set up to show me the path, but you can always run PWD to figure out where you are. Um, and LS to figure out what's in the folder of where you're at. Yep. We are going to npm install dash dash save. Um, and we are going to do the ones that we know we're going to need right off the bat, like cores and body parser. Um, see if there's any. We are going to need SQLize. So we, let's install that. And we'll also install PG for Postgres, so SQLize can talk to our database. Um, we are going to need a couple other ones, but we will figure that out as we go. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter on that. Remember to do my dash dash save as part of that command. So when I go to my package.json, I can see all the things that are installed. If you, it's two dashes if you type out the word, or it's a single dash if you use just dash s. I think dash. Uh, Postgres, and it still worked. Okay. Normally, if it's it's two dashes if you type out the word, and a single dash if you use the short hand for it, which is just dash s. But it's probably designed to do both. Yes. So C plus Express Chorus Body Parser, was that P, oh, PG? Yep. Oh, yeah. PG and Moment and Postgres? Um, I did not do Moment because okay. we're not doing anything okay. with time. So, so just, uh, okay. And PG, oh, PG is, is Postgres. Postgres. Okay. And these are all of our dependencies. Correct, for our back end. Okay. Okay, so we are going to uh, go to our index.js and start to use some of these now. So where do we start? So we're gonna, because we're in the back end, we're gonna use requires instead of imports. But the same idea, we're importing the package, we're requiring the package. So const express equals require express. And const app equals express with the parentheses. Um, we're going to need our const cores. And this process is called what, linking our dependencies? Or importing or requiring. Okay. Uh, const cores equals require cores. And we're going to tell, oops, we're going to tell express to use our cores. If I can type properly tonight. Um, and then we are going to repeat the process with our body parser is we're going to require it. And then we will tell our whoops. We will tell our express app to use it. Um, and we want to tell it to use the JSON parser in particular. 
So we do body parser.json with our parentheses. Hopefully this isn't new or, or foreign to anyone. Um, okay, we have our basic app set up. What's the last thing we need to do before we can test it? Yep. So we're going to app.listen. And I know we've been using 3000, but React likes to use 3000. And two things cannot be running on the same port. So we're going to jump all the way up to 5000. You can jump it to whatever you want, as long as it's not below 1000 or 8080. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're going to do our app.listen on 5000, and it's always a good idea to do a console log in here to make sure that it fired up properly. Or let's do server. Okay. And then in our terminal, we are going to just run nodemon and hit enter. And that will by default look in our index.js file and kick up our server. So you want that to the terminal and just type nodemon? Yes. Okay. And make sure you're in your backend folder in your terminal. Okay. So I'm going to do one more step and then I'll let people catch up. I'm going to go to uh, my browser and I'm going to go to localhost 5000 and I have cannot get slash. What step did we forget? Uh, server's already running with nodemon. Exactly. So our server is listening on 5,000, but we haven't told it to send anything on 5,000 on that route, that that path. So we're just gonna uh, push that down a little bit. We are going to app dot. Yep. And what are we going to get? Well, we're gonna get slash first. We have to tell it where it's getting. That's the root path. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then we are going to rec res. Glad I have drilled that into your guys' brain. And we are going to res.send a message that says, hello world, because they don't want the gods fighting me, the programming gods for not doing a hello world. Uh, I'm going to go back to my browser. Nodemon is running, so it's automatically rebooting our server for us. If anyone's having Nodemon issues, I'm happy to solve them now. Uh, I'm going to refresh, and I get my message, hello world. So I'm going to put the code back up. And if anyone needs help, holler. <laughs> so first of all, what we want to do is we want to open this folder that you're in so we can see all the files that were on the left. We're just going to go file open, and we're going to open up our thing in here. Uh, we haven't done create React app yet, but that's okay. So now when we open this, we'll see our backend folder in here with our path instructions. Great. Let's open up a new terminal. And we're in our all state folder already for us. So what we're going to do is create. Go ahead. Yep. Create dash React.
and now I'm trying to do your password for Mac. Oh, it's in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a nice Okay, so yep, now it's installed. So now we can use it. So uh, instead of rerunning the command, we're just going to hit the up arrow on your keyboard. And then up one more. And now we're going to hit enter, and it's going to rerun the command for us. Okay. Are you going to do a typing out any <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I'm just wondering why we're using base of the body um, so body parser is required whenever we send information from our front end and use a, a JSON format to upload that data in. Express gets the data and it goes, what is this? Like, is this, are you sending up form data? Or are you sending up XML? Or are you sending up JSON? There's so many different formats that you can send data into it that Express has gotten to the point where they're like, we aren't doing that anymore. Use a third party package. So that's what body parser is for, is it converts the, yeah. the string, the raw text that gets uploaded, and it goes, hey, check to see if that's JSON. And if that's JSON, throw it in rec.body. So we won't have access to rec.body down the road unless we use body parser and then tell Express, the Express app, to use body parser. So when you're doing this fetch, uh, do you use body into your that data into JSON. Into JSON, yes. Because fetch, you need to tell fetch, hey, when you make this request, tell it that I'm sending JSON up. So body parser knows to listen and convert that into uh, a JavaScript object. But you can't send objects over the internet. You can only send strings. So we do json.stringify and take that that JavaScript object and turn it into text and then tell the server in the headers, hey, we're sending up some JSON here. It's coming in as text, but just know the JSON is coming so we can reverse that process on the back end and get access to rec.body in the actual object. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. uh, Babacons are not a that might be coming from one of the Chrome extensions. Um, basically, what's happening is any page you load in Chrome is going to try and find a paper con for. And because we're just doing an API, we don't have a paper con set up. So you can ignore those, and then these are definitely coming from an extension. It's trying to load in some image. So I would just and ignore those. The, notes, the bigger issue is that's not yet. Uh, uh, so let's look at your code. Uh, yes, uh, back and up, so so I instead of console logging, uh, uh, we're just going to uh, send that as a string. It should have saved it. It's a Google Doc. No, no, my VS code yeah. is acting up, so I have to I have to reboot my computer. So once he starts up again, I'm like, ah, I can't tell that it's not working. Okay, so we start for someone to ask to do um, Did you start with no con or oh no, so you started with regular code. So the server's not automatically rebooting when you make a change. So let's control C out of that. And instead of node, let's just do node con and enter. And now your server will automatically reboot when you make a change you save it. So let's refresh. And there you go. Uh, no, because Nomon should be installed globally. So for the same reason for you, React app doesn't show up in either package.json, uh, the same thing for Nomon. We're running that at a global level, so it won't be in your, your uh, package.json. Okay. Doing it now. We both had a text code update after installing. That's fun. Uh, fun or fine? So fun. 
What what command is she trying from? As long as you have you have your you have your front end, so it created everything. Fine. So you're okay. Yeah, I thought it was fine. Just like the IP sheet. Yep. Yep, you're good. You're right there. So you just have to catch up on the index.js, which is the stuff on the screen in under backend. You might want to do that on the street. Stream. Oh, it did sound like you said stream. Oh, sorry. Stream. Get out. Okay. Everyone good? Yeah. All right. So we are going to get our um, front end talking to our back end. And then we are going to make a basic form on React and call it a day. We're not going to do any more auth stuff. We're not going to install any more packages. Um, oh, I lied. We are going to get, no. we're going to get SQLi set up and then we are going to go to the front end. Okay, so for SQLi, um, we could do it all in this one file, but it's generally considered bad form to have one giant file. So what we are going to do is we are going to const, um, no, we're not. We're going to const models equals require and our uh our dot slash models my god i cannot type tonight and then we're going to do a parenthesis after that and you might say well max how do you dot slash models we don't have a a models file well let's fix that so we're going to do a new file models.js and we are going to do a module.exports and the reason why we're doing that is we want access uh, to things inside this file from outside the file, right? We want to be able to use a require. And in order to require something, we need to export it. So we're going to do our module.exports, and we will do an arrow function here. And now we can const our SQLize in. Uh, and just pay attention to case here. Uh, it is a const SQLize with a capital S. But when we require it, we're going to require it with a lowercase s. Um, again, that's one of those things that might work fine if you do a capital S in the require on your Mac, but will make you pull your hair out when you go to deploy it on the server. Because when you run Node on the server, package names are case sensitive. When you run it on the Mac, they are not. So here in models.js is where we write the code to connect SQLize to the project. Correct. Um, and Postgres in particular. So let's do that. Let's do our const db is a new SQLize instance. We're opening a new connection to the database. And I'm going to type in my uh, max username here, my Mac username here, M-A-C apostrophe S, Mac. <laughs> Not my Max, my Mac. Um, and I'm also going to type it again one is the username and one is the database name. Um, if you open a new terminal, it should have your uh, your username uh, out in the front. Sure. Okay. Um, and then the last thing we're going to pass in is an empty string. And that's because the database we're going to connect to has no password. And then we need to pass in two more things in an object notation. If you're saying, Max, how do you know this? It's because I went through all of this earlier. I mean, because it's all in the SQLize documentation and I'm totally not cheating off my iPad. Um, we're going to go to host 127.0.0.1. And that's also localhost. Uh, and that's saying, look on our local computer. And then we're going to tell it, hey, how we're connecting is with Postgres. And just to, to prove I'm not just making this up, we go to SQLize and go to their manual. 
uh, oh, they changed their documentation. Go to V5, the latest version. Um, we can see that they have the, the SQLize information right here. We could follow this connection and, and just use Postgres with the username and password. Um, if you go to the getting started, they also have the database uh, documentation in here. And, and this is the, uh, the method I just used for connecting. Correct. Zero dot zero dot one. Okay, so we're we're here. Um, we need to do one more step, and that's of course have our our models, right? So I'm going to return, and I'm going to return the database in case I need access to it down the road. Um, and I'm also going to return a user, and the user we are going to define that model in the user table in our database. And we're going to need a couple fields here. Can anyone guess what fields we want in our user table? ID. So we, we should almost always start with ID. It's pretty rare to have a database table that does not have an ID on it. So we are going to do an ID and we are going to tell it the type is sqlize.integer, right? It's going to be a number and it's also going to be unsigned. So unsigned means it's gonna be a positive number. IDs are rarely negative. Uh, we are also going to tell it it's an auto increment. So basically figure out what the value is. We don't have to make up this ID. The database is automatically gonna look at the last row, add one and make that the, the uh, new ID. Uh, and we're also going to tell it that it is the primary key. So when we start using models down the road and associations and tying them together, SQLize knows that, hey, this is the primary key on the table. This is unique. This is how we can get a foreign key to talk to the primary key. Okay, great. What else do we probably need in our user table? Um, name. Name, but I'm actually going to make it username. And how, what kind of field is a username? It's a string. Should we um, separate it first name, last name? Or We're only gonna do the things required for off here. So in your capstone, it would be fine to add first name, last name, address, okay. email address, all of those fields. Okay. Um, we're only going to add two more fields to our users table. Can anyone guess what they are? Not a password. So <laughs> we are going to start with the most insecure and go every step of that video. So we're gonna start with storing a password in plain text. And we're going to get more and more secure. So we're going to start with plain text. We're going to then move to a hash without salt. And then we are going to move to a hash with salt. Okay. So to get started, we are just going to do our password. And that is going to be a sqlize.string as well. And we're going to make sure to spell password right. And we are going to be future thinking here. We are also going to add our salt and our salt is going to be a sqlize.string. And I'm going to put in parentheses three because our salt is going to be super short. It's only going to be three characters. So we can tell the database, hey, you don't have to expect this super long thing coming in. Uh, you can just expect three characters, which will make it uh, easier for the database to store it. Okay, we have to do one more thing in here. We have to tell the database uh, how we want it to init, how we want it to get set up. So we are going to do init as a function and we are just going to do our db.sync. And what the sync is going to do is it's gonna take our model and it's going to go, okay, let me sync this, this model, this table into Postgres and I'm going to create four columns, the ID, the username, the password and the salt based off of the type that was passed in here. So that's the whole point of the sync is, hey, when the server first boots up, let's get those two connected together. What two? Connect the models to the actual Postgres database, right? Because our Postgres database right now is gonna be empty. There's, there's not anything in it. So we want it to sync the models into Postgres. So the sync is actually going to read the models, convert it into SQL, and then execute that SQL on the database. Is Postgres the base name here? Postgres is the 
database. Oh, it, it is the database. The, the database. So these are just the fields. The models are the fields that we're creating. The model would be a table, and then the model will have properties in it which convert to columns in the database. Okay. Yeah. So the model is the table, and those rows are the fields. Like, yeah. Got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna do one more step. We are going to first of all save because I'm always great at forgetting to save. Um, and in addition to pulling in our models in our app.js, I'm sorry, in our index.js in our backend, we also need it to tell it to init. We just wrote that init code, but now we need to tell it to run. So what we are going to do is we are going to do models uh, init. We are going to save that. And do we think this is going to work? So there's going to be a problem. Um, and the problem that we have is, oh, I didn't know that. Um, it says unhandled rejection, sequelized connection refused. OK, well, what happened there? SQLize is trying to connect to Postgres, and we don't have Postgres running anywhere. So we could get fancy. We could use Docker. We could use a container, or we could take some shortcuts. So the shortcut I'm going to take, um, I covered this in the video, but there is a um, website called postgresapp.com. I'm going to dump that in the outline right now. Um, So uh, you can download and install that app just like you would any other app. Um, and you're just going to download it, move it to the applications folder. And then when you go to open it, it's going to look like this. And it's going to say not running. So all we have to do is click on start. And it's going to fire up Postgres for us. That's it. We don't need to go into Docker. We don't need to run commands. We don't have to have special scripts running. Um, Docker is great if you're managing a lot of different projects, if you're jumping between them. Um, but when we just want to get something up and running quick and we're focusing on this one app, um, we don't need to run Postgres in a container. Uh, we can just run it directly on our local computers. Um, so if I click on server settings here, no, that's not what I wanted. If I, I forget how you look up. Um, there's a way to see the username and password. Oh, maybe it's just in the documentation. So right here in the documentation on the page that we download it, um, you notice it says port 5432 user, your system username, database, same as user, password, none. That is all the information that we type in to our models.js file the database name or the username. Um, we passed in nothing for the password because that's empty. And then we said it's on 127001. The default port for Postgres is 5432. So that's why we didn't need to pass that in. Well, let's see if you're, if, so I'm going to start my server back up and it dumps out a bunch of SQL. So I will pause here. But if we look at what the, the SQL is doing, it's creating the table users. And it's creating the ID for us and the username and the password and the salt and the create that. So if we go into our P SQL, which we used a couple of weeks ago, which I will post the link to this if you don't have it installed, um, and connect into the database using the same settings, we can take a look at our users table which I totally did not cheat and do this earlier, um, and see that our table was created. So we, I clicked on users over on the left and clicked on structure at the top. And we can see it created our username, our password, and our salt fields for us. How did you get that again? Sorry. Um, I'm using the PSQL app, okay. um, which is a free app that I will post. Uh, it just lets you look at your database without, uh, without having to run any commands. Okay.
Okay. I just pasted that in. Sorry, Wanda, okay. if that I'm jumps sorry. around. Okay. Model on the end is a non-function. Okay, so let's trace it. So model is going to our model folder. So let's uh, jump in here. And we have the mid, and the mid is a function. So what's it telling us? So let's scroll all the way up to the top. You see how that's an arrow function? So what we actually have to do is run this export to get access to our end. Okay. So if we go back to our index.js, we're going to put two parentheses, an opening and a closing parenthesis at the very end of our models. File here? Uh, yeah. All the way, yeah, that line, but all the way at the end. Here. Yep, and opening and closing. And basically, that's just telling JavaScript, go run that code. Go make it export for me. So if we save, uh, yeah. now we get different information. Uh, scroll up a little bit to see where, now it's saying Postgres is not defined. So it's just our models like that. Is Postgres a variable or is Postgres a string? Wait, what? Oh, I see. Dialect Postgres? Yeah. That should be a string. Oh, that should be a string. Yeah. Is there any code that people want me to leave up on the screen while I'm helping? I'll, I will leave uh, this up. And this is all we're doing for, tonight. What did you do for the SQLite connection? Um, I was too busy worrying you about have to get the Postgres app installed oh. and then fire up your Postgres. If anyone wants to use Docker instead of Postgres app, I'm totally not faulting you for that. That's probably a great option. This is just a little shortcut. Um, do a search for Postgres app uh, or go to the outline and I have the. Okay, so you're running, so you're good there. Um, so try and reboot your server in the terminal for me and get a picture. Um, yeah, the link, yeah, that's fine. You can close that terminal because we don't need to be inside the database right now. Uh, turning, and then, uh, yeah, you can close it. It's just a menu bar app. Notice we have an elephant up the top now. Um, and so now let's uh, stop your server with Control C and then reboot it. And enter. Hey, you're running. Running. Well, some stuff. Serves. Thanks. No, I thought I'm going to close it. I want to say this again for the, for the record. I'm not discouraging Docker use. I'm just <laughs> showing a shortcut to how to get uh, Postgres up and running. Okay. Okay. Not that code. Oh, not that code. Uh, so now oh, no, 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 your code may be fine. Just follow the recording and stuff. Follow the code I sent you earlier. Um, I uh, had just because there's a lot of stuff that's like day two and bring it beyond. Uh, like, yeah. 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 Yep, that's what gets served. No, we don't have the app got listed yet because that's going to be a requirement to get no so one up. So that would be the next step. Okay, so your error is so tiny, I need to sit down to read it. <laughs> okay. Um, it says cannot connect. So um, let's just control C out of your server. If you get an error connection um, and you do have Postgres running, just hit control C to back out of your server, stop your server, and then reboot your server. Okay. Um, so connection error uh, role and I did not just okay. So let's look. Um, oh, is that that's what it should be. After that, 
Can you shoot your server one more time? And it should be user. You're good. You're all connected. So you can download PSQL if you don't have it already and take a look inside your database uh, to EQL, yes, go now, um, and see that the table got created inside your database. But you're, you should be good in all costs. Oh, wait, wait, where should I download these? Uh, you'll put it in your applications folder once it downloads. Okay, let's take a look. Um, uh, so it ran the SQL, so we should be good. Let's go back to PSQL. Um, close that tab. Uh, just close the window and go up to the PSQL. Yeah, hold on. Um, new window. Uh, oh, where is my voice in the Should be running on that. Okay, there we go. Oh, there we go. So that refresh button at your bottom left this is going to be your friend. Okay, all right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Kate. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's all, right. all right, we're good. That was helpful. Okay, so let's take a step back. What did we do tonight? We set up our back end, but we didn't just set up our back end. We also got our front end app created. Even though we didn't fire it up, we got that created. We got our models file created. We connected it to the database and we got our first table created. So this is not just, all right, we set up the back end, we're done. It's, we got a lot accomplished here. And so when you start thinking about your capstones, one task is not set up the back end. A task is set up the back end, create the, the project file, install dependencies, install SQLize, connect SQLize to Postgres, get Postgres started. That is the level that you want to break things down into. Because when you have that, what the industry calls a punch list, because you're just punching through it. You're just doing one thing after another. You're crossing it off. And now when you get stuck on one thing, you go, wait, look at everything I accomplished. I can get through this next thing. Because if you just think, I need to set up my back end, I can't do this from scratch. I don't remember all of these steps, right? I cheat and I have my iPad with the code all right now. But what did I do earlier today? I went through and I made a list of, okay, we need to install SQLize, we need to get the connection to it, we need to get uh, Postgres running, right? I went through all of those steps before I wrote a line of code, before I ran anything in the terminal, I had my list of everything that needed to get done before I dive into this code. So, for your capstones, definitely start generating a list. The smallest things possible, the, you, the, as small as a task you can break it down, break it down to that level because you'll find yourself flying through them when they're that small and it, you'll get on a roll. Cool. Okay. Okay, so hit OK. And you're gonna to wanna to move that into your applications folder. And now when you go to applications and open it, it should not come at you. Okay. So you're gonna do host is your user, uh, host is your Mac username for your full name, all lowercase. And then username uh, is gonna be the same thing. And then just password. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, host, you can leave as local host, the database name is your name. Thank you. Very uh, no, that's going to stay on 5432. Our, our backend server is running on 5000. Our Postgres server is running on 5432. So just change the database to your name. Uh, the last field there. 
Okay, now we have our users table, which is awesome, and we have stuff. Go ahead and put it down. Okay. Um, now we're going to. Uh, that's just a big chat. So we're going to ask drag and drop that for our applications folder. Um, the trackpad doesn't like it when you use two fingers. So yeah. if you put that yeah. two on screen, like in Oh, you have. You have a set up. Yep. Okay, hold on. Just let me... I'm just going to stop the share and stop the stream. 